Morbidly beautiful radio for radio. We for radio. We for radio. We for radio. Welcome to another episode of the Calling Hours Horror Podcast on Morbidly Beautiful Radio. Once again, it is I, your head undertaker, the dead man Michael Jones of MorbidlyBeautiful.com, Coffin Cuties Magazine, and Digital Dead Magazine. What's going on, world? Tonight, we're going to have another fantastic episode. Tonight, we will have director... Producer, writer, actor, uh, Richard Roundtree. He he graduated from the University of Kent in Canterbury with a degree in film studies with honors. Uh, He's lived and worked all around the world. Holland, France, Canada, Vegas, Los Angeles. And he completed work on a number of award-winning low to medium budget features, including several as an associate producer. Since 2014, he has written, produced, and directed six award-winning short films, which have screened at festivals around the world. His debut horror feature film is currently in post-production, with an anticipated uh, release date for uh, it was mid-2017. So we're going to be talking with him about uh, his career, the stuff he's worked on, He is a European filmmaker, which is nice. I don't get a chance to have very many European 
talents on because of the time difference and things like that. So that should be a lot of fun. Make sure to stay tuned in for that at the 8.30 hour. In our digital dismemberment spotlights this evening, we will be covering Scream Factory's Blu-ray releases of Dark Angel as well as Psycho 3. Both fun films to watch. Both looked really good. We'll get to those in just a moment. But before that, we will be hearing from three bands in our Metal Massacre Spotlight this evening. So let's get right to our first song. The name of the band is Necrophobic. The CD is Mark of the Necrogram. And the song is Pesta.
Welcome back. You just heard the band Necrophobic. The CD was Mark of the Necrogram, and the song was Pesta. Necrophobic is a Swedish blackened death metal band formed in 1989 by drummer Joachim Sternum and now deceased guitarist David Parland. It is believed that the band named themselves after a Slayer song from the 1986 seminal album Rain in Blood. The pair played as a revolving door lineup of musicians until the permanent addition of bassist Tobias Sadgard. This addition occurred prior to recording their debut seven-inch single, The Call, in early 1992. If you want to find out more about this band, where they're touring, where to pick up their CDs and their merchandise, make sure to head on over to www.necrophobic.net. Coming up in just a few moments, we're going to go into our feature interview with writer, director, producer, and actor Richard Roundtree. But before that, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for some digital dismemberment. And in our first digital dismemberment spotlight for the evening, we are covering Screen Factory's Blu-ray release of Dark Angel. <clears throat> now, the film is directed by Craig R. Baxley. Its producers were Mark Damon, Raphael Einsman, Ron Fury, David Saunders, John Turtle, Jeff Young, and Moshi Diamant. Special effects were handled by Gabriel Bartelis, Evan Brainerd, Michael Burnett, Tony Garner, Lauren Givens, Larry Hamlin, Kevin Hudson, Rick Lalonde, Roger McCoyne, Greg Polanovich, A.J. Workman, Cher Zar, Jor Van Klein, and Bruno Van Zebroek. The cast includes Dolph Zungren, uh, excuse me, Dolph Lundgren, Brian Benben, Betsy Brantley, Matthias Hughes, Jay Billis, Jim Haney, David Aykroyd, Sherman Howard, Sam Anderson, Mark Lowenthal, Michael J. Pollard, Jesse Vint, and Alex Morris. It was released by Shout Screen Factory on Blu-ray in 2013. To give you the premise of the film, Detective Jack Kane, played by uh, Dolph Lundgren, thought he dealt with every kind of crime on Earth, but now someone is using human bodies to manufacture narcotics. Someone, or something, not of this world. To the alien that has arrived on Earth, humans represent ideal drug factories because of our endorphins. To Detective Kane, the alien represents mankind's worst threat. If the alien's mission succeeds, our planet will be destroyed. Together with a straight arrow FBI partner and his girlfriend, the city coroner, Kane is going to send the alien home in pieces. Uh, just, you know, for the rest of the review, so everyone knows, of course, spoiler alerts. Dolph fans rejoice. After coming off a string of popular films that included A View to a Kill in 1985, Rocky IV in 85, Masters of the Universe in 1987, Red Scorpion in 88, and The Punisher in 89, Dark Angel, a.k.a. I Come in Peace, gives us Dolph as a Houston cop who plays by his own rules to bring in the bad guys. He plays his role to the hilt and shows that when it comes to action films, he certainly has earned his place. The film also has ESPN analyst Jay Billis as the good alien, and this was before his ESPN career. The acting and story, an interplanetary alien drug dealer killing humans to create his narcotics, are better than first glance would indicate, and the amount of technical effects in the film certainly gives plenty of eye candy to gawk at. The typical 80 hair metal soundtrack in the film helps to establish a nice, a nice sense of nostalgia as well. It almost boggles the mind to think that Dolph was 33 at the time the film was made, but he barely looks a day over 25. A true testament to how well he has taken care of himself over the years. The film had the initial title of Lethal Contact, but the production, filming, international, and worldwide release title is Dark Angel. The U.S. release title was changed to I Come in Peace due to two other existing movies that were called The Dark Angel. 
One of those was in 1925, and the other one was in 1935. So a little bit more about the film. A man in a luxury car is driving down the road in the city and swerves to miss a bus. The car comes to a rest in a Christmas tree lot. As the man goes to inspect the damage to his car, a bright flash of light and explosions rock the area. As he looks on in disbelief, a large humanoid alien steps out from the fire and says, I come in peace. Next, we see a man breaking into an evidence locker room, murdering a cop in the process. They steal a bunch of drugs, and as they leave the building, they set off an explosion to mask their getaway. We now see Jack, who's played by Dolph Lundgren, outside of a club on a stakeout mission. The car with the robbers pulls off as he sits outside, and they enter the building. He observes two different thugs entering a building across the way to rob a store, and as he goes to stop the robbery, his partner is shot by the men that knocked off the evidence locker room. Suddenly, the alien appears and mows down the majority of the crooks. Jack runs in to find his partner and the crooks dead. As forensics tries to make heads or tails of the scene, Jack and his superior are yelling at each other, and Jack is told to take a vacation or lose his job. He goes to leave until Inspector Switzer shows up and puts him back on the case with a new partner from the FBI. As Jack and Smith argue back and forth about protocol, we see another explosion and a different alien land in an abandoned building. Later, we see the original alien attacking and kill a bar owner. Jack and Smith track down a lead at a local pool hall strip club. They go back to the crime scene and they find the alien weapon that killed Jack's partner. The second alien is seen walking around the city, mission unknown. The first alien appears again, this time attacking and killing a man in a warehouse. This time we see him inserting a rod into his victim's head and extracting fluid from it. As he finishes, the second alien appears and a spectacular firefight breaks out, but the first alien escapes. The next day, the first alien strikes again, this time killing a female mechanic in her garage. Jack and Smith go to visit a friend of Jack's who has examined the murder weapon they found the night before. They go to visit the coroner to find out more information about the victims, but they are still stymied by the events. They leave the station and are attacked driving down the road by part of the same crew that murdered Jack's partner. After a narrow escape, Jack confronts a business partner of the crew to try and convince them he had nothing to do with the murders, but they don't believe him. They kidnap Smith and force Jack to run their errands for them. As Jack makes the drop, the first alien confronts him in the alley, but the second alien intercepts and gives chase to the first. Later, it is mortally wounded, and before dying, tells his story to Jack and Smith. Finally armed with the truth, Jack and Smith must put aside their differences and try to stop the alien before it's too late. But do they have the means and a way to stop the alien, or will it continue to kill at will and bring more of its kind here? You're going to have to watch the film to find out. Bonus features include a look back at Dark Angel, which has a runtime of 25 minutes. This has interviews with director Craig R. Baxley and actors Dolph Lundgren and Brian Benben. They discuss all the elements of the film, from the script and budget to the cast and crew. Particular attention is paid to the effects and stunt work in the film. It also includes the theatrical trailers, um, Poster and still gallery. This is a one disc set with an NTSC format. It is a color film with an R rating. Aspect ratio is 1080p high definition widescreen, 178.1. Screen Factory brings us entertaining, if not slightly campy and high octane sci fi thrillers to Blu ray with the release of Dark Angel. The film was originally released on VHS and Laserdisc in 1991 by Media Home Entertainment with a Region 2 widescreen and a Region 4 full-screen DVD available in Europe, Japan, and Australia. In September 2011, in the United States, MGM made the film available in their MOD line with a widescreen DVD that was available online. Not being able to track down copies of these for comparison, I am hard-pressed to believe that any of them possess sound transfer that Shout and Screen Factory is supplied for the film. One of the, Blu-ray, one of the Blu-rays that is part of their lower price point line it is not chock full of special features like many of their other titles, 
but the interviews are nice and give a peek behind the curtain, and it was nice to see the theatrical trailer again for the first time in years. Shout and Scream Factory are showing again why they are the standard bearer for Blu-ray sci-fi horror releases with this film's first first North American release, uh, Blu-ray release. Overall, I give the movie a 3 out of 5. I give the Blu-ray a 7 out of 10. I would definitely recommend that you head on over to Shout and Scream Factory to pick up your Blu-ray release of Dark Angel. Now, don't forget that just in a few minutes, we're going to go into our feature interview with writer, director, producer, and actor Richard Roundtree. But before that, we're going to go into our second Metal Massacre Spotlight. The name of the band is Ultar, the CD is Kadath, and the name of the song is Azazoth.
and welcome back. You just heard the band Old Tar. The CD was Kadath, and the name of the song was As Thou Thoth. Sorry, I pronounced it wrong the first time. Old Tar is a five-piece band from the heart of Siberia that is placed admits that is placed amidst the Howling Woods and Red Mountains. Founded in 2011 under the name Death Knife as a post-black metal act. The band was reborn in 2016 and with the new name, New Approach, and Epically Atmospheric Sound. If you want to find out more about this band, where they're touring, how to pick up their merchandise and their CDs, make sure to head on over to www.facebook.com backslash Oltar Band. But now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for our feature interview. the sea of darkness and all therein that may be explored. And welcome to our feature interview this evening. And tonight I consider to be a very special show. I, I have a rare opportunity to do something that I normally don't get to do, and that's interview someone from across the pond. It's not often I get to have someone from, uh, you know, from the European nations, come on and talk about filmmaking because it would be interesting to hear if, if filming is different overseas. And the gentleman that I have with me this evening uh, is a graduate of uh, Kent University in Canterbury where he got his degree in film studies with honors. And that man's name is Richard Roundtree. Richard, welcome to the show. Hi, Michael. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, no, it's great. And like I said, thank you so much for coming on. I think the last time I had anyone from uh, Europe on was when I had Barbie Wilde and uh, Nicholas Vince on. You know, I mean, it's it's a rare I'm opportunity. Hell, either, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm still trying to get an interview with Danny Filth. That one's getting hard to do because they're on tour. But, but anyway, <laughs> you know, just going over your filmography is, is just absolutely stunning. And, you know, you've done art department, you're a producer, a writer, a director, actor, I mean, pretty much everything you can do, editor. But the majority of your credits are in art in the art department. And for the majority of those projects, you're listed as a key greensman. Kind of tell everyone what you do in that capacity and why your job is so important, especially when you look at the titles on your resume. <laughs> sure. So, um, as a greenman is uh, somebody who deals with uh, uh, plants and uh, natural scenery uh, within film or TV, and that, that kind of the scope of that, uh, you know, very wildly. So. We could be doing um, a scene in a movie with a, a hospital where there's just a, a single plant in the corner uh, of a waiting room or something for relatives, uh, right up to, to designing and, and installing a, a full set of greenery, which is um, anything that's all based, so a forest, a jungle, a desert, anything anything within that sub kind of range. And it can it, it does my paid day job, and it really does veer from one end of uh, that scale to the other. You know... It's something that you really don't think about when you think about filming. You know, I remember the first time I stepped on a set and, you know, 
we were out in the woods and it, and it was just like we tried to use as much natural scenery as possible but for a job like yours when you when you're doing i mean because you've worked on stuff like uh jurassic park uh the descent i mean just so many things kind of talk about the vision that you need to have and and being on the same page with you, you know your director when you're setting all of that up Sure. So, I mean, I, again, it kind of, you know, it varies quite wildly. You know, some um, some directors you work with just completely, you know, disinterested in it. They see it as something that, they, you know, they don't really pay a lot of attention to. Um, uh, but, you know, it's is essential, uh, you know, to these things to, to make them real. You know, if you ever go to a dentist's waiting room or a doctor's waiting room, they pretty much always have, you know, a desk uh, with, a, with a plant on it. You know, that's just how real life works. And so if you don't incorporate those kinds of small pieces of detailing into a, 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 you know, a feature film or a TV show, you know, immediately you're kind of disengaging the audience because there, there's something not quite right about the scene for them. Um, uh, and, and yeah, and again, at the other end of the scale, you know, you've got something where, you know, you have to have different grades of sound, you know, whether you're doing a, you know, an Arizona desert or a, an African desert or an Australian desert, you know, there's different kind of shades of sound that you would mix together and things. So, it, you know, it's, it, it's one of those jobs in the the, uh, the film industry, like um, perhaps like a scenic painter, where you know your knowledge is very specialist, um, uh, and as long as you're doing what you do well, nobody else really kind of pays too much attention to it. But <laughs> as soon as you start doing something ridiculous and, and putting a you know a red plant in or a, you know uh, or a blue plant, you know then it, then of course it stands out immediately. So. As long as you're doing your job properly, then you're kind of uh, in the background and not noticed. Now, one of the things that I that I find interesting about your job, you know, is is that when you're doing that, you're you're working with you know real material, real things, and looking through your resume, through all of the genres, all of the TV shows, the movies, are projects that utilize CGI more difficult for you, or are those easier projects? Um, I mean, I you know, they're, 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 again, it's kind of you know, there's no kind of hard and fast formula. I mean, we did um, uh, we did a movie called A Monster Calls um, with uh, Juan Antonio Bayona, uh, who directed the new Jurassic Park movie a few years ago, and um, it, it features a character that is a, a giant tree tree. Uh, he comes to life and he's voiced by Liam Neeson. Now, obviously, when he comes to life, he's, he's completely CGI. And then um, the guys on set had um, pre-visualizations of how he was going to move around the things. But the, um, uh, the, the main character in the movie is kind of this 12, 13-year-old boy. And he, uh, as an actor, he needed something to, to interact with um, when he was on set. So we had to build a portion, the bottom portion of the tree, uh, with certain bits in it. There's a uh, few scenes where he hits the tree because he's down the root of the tree, so we had to make those with latex um, so that, you know, when he was punching the tree, you know, he didn't hurt himself and, and so on and he damaged the tree itself. So we built the bottom section, which was maybe uh, 12 or 14 feet tall, uh, for, 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 and more for the actor to interact with than anything else and then uh, just to give it a bit of texture in those shots. Um, but, of course, you know, when you get out into the, the medium and the wide shots, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's enhanced by CGI as much as anything else. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, it, it, a lot of the time these guys, you know, on the, on the bigger budget movies, the, the pre-visualization that's done for the VFX kind of, you know, we get, we get shown it maybe sometimes and they say, like, this is what's happening. And, and we, we kind of have a small element of that. Um, so our stuff is not necessarily always what you're actually seeing in the final product, but it, it, the majority of the time is there for the actors to interact with as much as anything else. Now, um, with so many credits to your name, you know, going by IMDb, and we know IMDb can be wrong, so please feel free to, <laughs> to correct me if anything here is wrong, but from what I can see, 2008 was when you started working in film. You're listed as an actor for Inconceivable, and I believe you're also listed as a producer on that. How did you, what made you yeah. decide to go to college and study film? What What was it that drew you to it? So, uh, I mean, I, I, I was an only child growing up, uh, no brothers and sisters and just my mom at home, and um, so I used to watch a lot of movies. 
Um, uh, I remember quite vividly when we got our first VHS player, uh, we used to be able to rent them over here before, you know, people could afford to buy them, uh, kind of in the, the mid 80s and early 80s. So uh, I remember getting that and then, you know, kind of the, the, the video rental store opening up down the road from me and just going every weekend and then renting movies out and choosing ones with the best uh, cover artwork and the most exciting cover artwork for me to watch. So, that was a, that was a big thing when I was growing up. So and, and I kind of knew, you know, when I was maybe six or seven years old that I wanted to make movies. Um, what actually happened was, I you know, I, I went to university and, and I studied for three years to do that. And then when I came out, you know, you, you've got these kind of debts around your neck and and so on from from going to college and stuff. And um, so you know, I went and took a job uh, that that was within the industry, but to, to kind of pay off the debts and and you know pay the bills sort of thing and uh, I ended up getting caught up in that for a number of years uh, kind of working on other people's films and, and uh, about five or six years ago I kind of realised you know what am I doing I, you know I've kind of I, <laughs> I've sacrificed my own desires of making my own movies you know to help other people make their movies and pay the bills so I uh, kind of got together with a group of people who, who were kind of just like me in the same sort of situation and we just decided let you know, we've, we, we, we can't afford to give up our day jobs, as it were, but, you know, we're going to make a concerted, concerted effort now to, to sit down and, and, and try and make a short film. And one short film led to another short film to another short film. And sure. We ended up, you know, uh, two years ago doing the feature, our first feature. So, it's um, yeah, it's been it's been a bit of a ride. I mean, yeah, so I finished uh, university in 2002, so uh, like 16 years or something I've been working in the industry and, Maybe only five years of that I've been uh, actually making my own movies. <laughs> now, where would you say your love for horror came from? Uh, yeah, from those early days in the kind of, uh, you know, the, the video rental uh, stores. I mean, I, I, I really vividly remember watching uh, The Shining on TV when I was, uh, again, you know, maybe seven, eight years old and, and just being kind of completely mesmerized by it. And um, even things... You know, kind of, you wouldn't necessarily consider horror, but, you know, as a, as a young kid, you might do, um, things like Jaws and Gremlins. And I just love the adrenaline rush of, um, of feeling scared, I guess, uh, uh and the, the, the kind of relief that you feel after you've watched one of those movies. So, uh, horror's always been my genre. <laughs> now, this is interesting again, because I don't get to interview very many people from overseas. Now, you and I are very, close in age and you actually grew up in the video nasties era what was it yeah for sure yeah yeah can you kind of talk about that for a moment like you know i can't speak on how films are are cut edited censored over there but i mean i did write an article about it and it, it amazed me to see certain films and what was cut out or how much was cut out you know do you feel like you missed out on certain things as a kid you know were you able to see the unedited movies or did you have to wait until you were older to see you know the what was it like the seven minutes cut from the texas chainsaw massacre and stuff like that yeah, I mean, in, in fact, over here, I think it was a lot more harsh than it was even even in North America. I mean, I think I didn't get to see the Texas Chainsaw Massacre until I think I was seventeen when it, when it came when they re-released it over here when it kind of the the ban was lifted. And the same with the Exorcist. Mm -hmm. um, the Exorcist, I don't think I got to see till I was about sixteen or something like that. Uh, and that wasn't, you know, they got theatrical releases when they when they were first released, uh, but they were not allowed uh, to come out on home video because they were deemed as as you know, kind of, uh, you know, films that would corrupt the younger viewers, as it were, over here. So, yeah, I, there, there was a, a lot of those movies that, that I didn't get to watch. And then before I went to college, I actually did a course on, um, uh, we call them A-levels over here, on um, uh, kind of, you know, film theory. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of these kind of movies, Gorilla Killer and things like that, came up as, as, as part of this course. And, you know, that kind of just led me to, to, to wanting to see them more, you know, in this day and age now, you know, kids are kind of, um, they're very, yeah, you know, they're, they're, they're so much open to them. They, you know, if a movie got banned these days, they could, you know, go and track it down on YouTube or Vimeo or somewhere. But, you know, we, I think it's difficult for, for the younger generation to understand that we didn't kind of have, you know, that kind of freedom and access to everything. It was, um, and it was, it really was quite hard over here, you know, it was, um, there, there was a lot of movies that, that 
that were banned. I mean, I, I even fairly recently, I only got to see uh, Cannibal Holocaust oh. um, for the first time, and it was something. It was something that I wanted to see raises, and actually, when I ended up watching it, I was just kind of like, "Oh my goodness, what have I done? I, don't, I wish I hadn't seen all these animal cruelty things." <laughs> um, uh, but that was, but that was another one that you know, just, they they, they develop this kind of mythos around them, and uh, 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 yeah, they just weren't available. So yeah, we we didn't get to watch until we were a bit older. And we're going to continue in this vein for a few more moments, but let me ask you this: Is it? St- is the censorship still the same over there, or has that relaxed as the years have gone on? Yeah, it's very much relaxed over here now. Much more relaxed. Um, uh, I mean, there's not. I, you know, I think there's a big thing. Um, always, uh, one of the stories that I remember reading through through college was about um, a Clockwork Orange being a, one of the banned movies, but. Um, that one actually ever banned over here. It was, um, it was, it was withdrew it from uh, theatrical release, uh, as far as I'm aware, because uh, there'd been copycat uh, killings. So I, I think that was kind of, you know, maybe the start of, of public awareness of, of these kinds of things. But it seems to be much more relaxed now. I mean, I, I've spent, you know, a fair deal of time living in the States and Canada and I don't feel like there's, there's a great deal of difference in, in what we see. There might be the odd cuts here and there. Um, uh, whereas I think in North America, you guys or the, the censors in North America are perhaps slightly more concerned with things like uh, language mm-hmm. um, uh, usage, whereas over here they might be a bit more concerned about kind of showing blood. And so, you know, there's, there's a few differences, but, but I think on the whole, it's, it's fairly similar. Well, see, it's funny because to me, you know, like a lot of the differences that that I see just from personal observation is like uh, it seems like uh, European films have a little bit more of a lax uh, look towards nudity and sexuality, whereas over here in the States, people get super hyped up over stuff like that. But whereas we can show all the violence and the blood that we want, but over there, you guys frown on that. So I think it's an interesting cultural dichotomy on, on how film is viewed differently across, you know, the ocean. There is for sure. And I think, you know, the UK is kind of a halfway house between mainland Europe and North America, you know, I mean, um, uh, you know, very much in that, that, that European movie scene, you know, I, I feel like, yeah, they, they push the boundaries perhaps more than we do. And then we're kind of a, a gatekeeper to North America where, yeah, I, like you say, you know, there's this kind of three-tiered system almost of, of, of what's acceptable in different countries. I mean, I, the, the, the only movie that I remember seeing recently, uh, which which I know had, had lots of cuts between different countries, was a, a Serbian film. Oh, my God, yes. Um and yeah, I mean, I, uh, I watched that and I was, you know, I was completely horrified <laughs> when I watched it. And I know that there's been, you know, you know, fairly decent lengths cut out of it for the UK market. Um, so, you know, yeah, I, I say, I think what's, what's deemed acceptable by different cultures is, uh, is very different around the world. Hmm. Do you, now, that's an interesting aspect too now, because as you're moving into the filmmaking industry, are you more concerned about making your films acceptable in Europe as opposed to the U.S., or are you just making what it is that you want to make? Yeah, that's exactly that's exactly the case. I mean, we the, the, the four of us who uh, who founded Ash Mountain Films, um, we we set out with a very definite kind of mission, you know, that we'd agreed on amongst ourselves that. We only want to make movies that we would want to watch ourselves. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think by doing that, you kind of uh, you, you, you draw your own lines in the sand about what you think is acceptable. I mean, three of the four of us have got fairly young kids, you know. So obviously, <laughs> we feel like there's a, a kind of a ring fence around, you know, seeing anything, you know, horrific towards kids like maybe you see in a Serbian film or whatever. You know, it doesn't put them completely off limit. You know, don't get me wrong. I, you know, I still like seeing it possessed child movie or something, but um, in terms of, 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 you know, what's generally acceptable, um, I think I think we, our, our tastes are fairly broad, um, but also, you know, restricted within, you know, probably what most most audiences would, would be willing to put up with watching. One of the other things that I found interesting about the whole um, Video Nasties things was 
you know, the, the crackdown on violence, on sexuality, you know, things like that. But if you look at a lot of the movies that were on that list, yes, there are American films, but the vast majority of the films listed are made by European film directors. You look at people like Argento, Fulci, you know, yeah. people like that, you know, d- was the video nasty thing, in your opinion, more of a way to curb what was going on in cinema in Europe, and it just kind of rolled into a worldwide thing? Well, I mean, I, from my understanding of it, I mean, it was it was a little bit before my time. I mean, probably five years or something. Um, you know, I was, I was very much kind of grew up in the the, the, the aftermath of it, but um, my understanding of it from from the UK censors' uh, point of view was that. It was anything to do with the kind of uh, the urban or the normalization of um, the, the the aspects of those horror movies. So hmm. um, it would be things like with Driller Killer, you know, using a household drill as a as a weapon. That was the kind of thing that they were really, really strongly, you know, against. You know, making making anything seem normal. So this is kind of where uh, we've got this culture in the UK, maybe where. Um, it's acceptable to show um, kind of you know monstrous incarnations of, of people or monsters, uh, you know, as as your villains in in horror movies. Whereas anything that's kind of a bit more along the lines of uh, you know this could actually happen uh, is 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 not quite so acceptable over here. Hmm. Now, and see, and that's the other thing that really fascinates me is you know we look at you know England alone. Camera horror, you know, one of the the greatest staples of the horror genre came from over there. You look at some of your, yeah. again, your all-time classic directors. You look at your Fulci's. You look at your Mario Bava's. You look at your Dario Argento's. You know, there, there are so many names that we could throw in there. And, you know, it seemed, you know, after Hammer went away, it seemed, I'm not going to say European cinema died, but it's it's never recovered you know not being over there i mean i can't speak to what the film culture is like but is there a big underground film circuit there is there is there a variation of what you would call hollywood over there how, how does the film industry work in you know in europe yeah i mean i you know it's certainly from my experience within the uk is is there's kind of you know is the two tier aspect is big budget or no budget there's, there's right. kind of nothing in between anymore um whereas like you say you know companies like hammo who were actually based just up the road from where i live um uh, at bray studios you know they would be have this kind of roger corman uh, mentality almost you know where they were just churning out lots and lots of films um, with very similar casts using the same set over and over again, you know, very brutally, but they were providing the, 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 the audience with, with a lot of different movies, um, in very quick succession. And, and they were very successful. I mean, there's, there's a very, very good documentary. Uh, if your viewers look it up on YouTube, um, it's called A History of Horror. Uh, and it's four one hour episodes hosted by a guy called, um, Mark Gatiss, which is G-A-T-I, double S, I believe. And, and, it delves through the kind of history of horror movies, um, uh, in, and, and each part of it is is very, very definitive. So there's one about you know the kind of origins of, of horror with the Universal uh, classic movies, uh, and then there's one about about British and European horror, which will go into far more detail than I can here. But yeah, it's a, it seems to come in waves. You know, we 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 kind of have these resurgences, and then it dies off for a few years, but. Um, uh, you know, to my mind at the moment, from the, from the people that I've met at festivals and, and, and in the industry over the last couple of years since we've been doing our horror films, um, you know, it, it, it's very, very alive and well over here. You know, there's, there's a, a very strong core audience for it. Um, and there's some great filmmakers uh, at the moment we've got in the UK as well um, who are all putting stuff out and, and just, you know, trying to, trying to appropriately budget you know, these, these movies that these guys are doing is, you know, we, we were kind of, you know, we're of an age, uh, Ash Mountain films, where we kind of like, devil may care attitude, we're going to go out and do it and, you know, let the chips fall where they may. But, um, I think, I think it, just because of the nature of the industry, a lot of younger directors perhaps are a little bit wary of kind of going down the same path that we have. They feel like they need more money, uh, need more time and, and, 
you know, to, to absolutely nail it 100% perfect the first time, whereas we were just like, well, we're going to go out and do it and see what happens. And, and, you know, in this case, we were very, very pleased with the response we got. So. You know, the advent of YouTube, um, Netflix, Vimeo, you know, all of these streaming locations that you can put stuff out now. Are you surprised, considering all of the outlets that are now available to filmmakers, that we have not seen the return of Hammer Horror Studios to film? Yeah, I mean, I think they, they, they kind of tried to reform under a slightly different banner. They used the name Hammer and they did, um, uh, they did a, a version of The Woman in Black uh, with Daniel Radcliffe from, from the Harry Potter movies, which I mm -hmm. think, you know, they made a fair bit of money from. Uh, a few years ago, maybe, I don't know, maybe seven, eight years ago now. Um, and they, you know, I think they've done one or two things, um, where, where, you know, they're trying to get back into it, but it's not really the same spirit as the original where they're kind of reusing the same sets and, you know, the same crews are just working over and over again together. It's, uh, they're, they're, they're a slightly higher end budget now, you know, they're going to movies where they're, you know, it's, it's a very different marketplace now, obviously, from, from when they were making those movies before. And, and, you know, they feel like if they're going to invest some money, then obviously they have to get a, a theatrical release for them. Whereas, you know, so many independent, uh, smaller budget movies, I'll, I'll go, you know, go straight to DVD or VOD and, and still find their audience. But, um, uh, yeah, it's the, the kind of prestige thing of it because they've got this name hammer behind them, you know, it's, it's almost something I think they don't want to give up necessarily. So rather than harking to the, the old hammer, as it were, uh, they're, they're, they're treading a slightly different path. Ah, uh, man, I, I miss those glory days. I mean, I watch my Blu-rays all the time, but it's it's just not the same. I want to see something new. I want, you know, I just I miss that European style of filmmaking. It's it's very different, and it's and it's hard being here in the states. I don't get to see a lot of the independent horror that that's released over there. You know, a lot of times we don't hear about it. You know, it's, it's sad. I yeah. wish, I wish we could do more with that, but let's talk about you some more now. You know, you do the greens, you know, you do writing, you do directing, acting, editing, you know, you wear so many hats, you know, which one do you find to be the most challenging for you and which one entertains you the most? <laughs> uh, the acting one is definitely the most challenging one. I absolutely <laughs> hate it. Um, uh, we, I, I ended up um, getting uh, called in for, for a couple of jobs where I was working in the crew and, and it was kind of like, oh, we need, a, we need an extra actor and uh, I ended up in a, a in this movie inconceivable that you mentioned earlier. We were we were shooting in Las Vegas, uh, and they had a scene with um, Jennifer Tilly uh -huh. um, and uh, uh, Elizabeth. Oh, I can't remember her name. Um, <laughs> uh, and and there was a scene with them two, those two ladies in a bar, and they were having a conversation. They needed a bartender in the background, and they were they kind of picked on me and went, "You look the most like a bartender. Put this shirt and tie on and go behind the bar." And um, it was like the most nerve-wracking hour or hour and a half of my life, and I absolutely hated it. <laughs> um, uh, and ever since then, we, we kind of do it as a little uh, a little hidden joke between us. You know, Hitchcock always used to be in his movies, so uh, they kind of, uh, the, the guys wind me up, I have to be in all the movies, so I ended up playing a taxi driver in the last movie, and just doing these small set of roles, which I absolutely hate. <laughs> now... As far as being a director, again, IMDb, so let me know if, the, if this is wrong, but um, 2014 was when you started your directorial debut, and you had three shorts in 2014. You kind of had the, the dark comedy, uh, the cake hole, you had the sci-fi one, reversible lines, and you had the short horror one, fixations. Can you kind of tell me yeah. how you became involved with those projects and what was your first experience on set like as a director for you? Yeah, so um, uh, basically, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, like basically um, the, 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 a few of us got together and we were kind of all in a similar situation where we wanted to make movies, you know, as our career and we all kind of drifted away from that kind of centralized theme. So we decided to get together um, uh, and, and 
what really forced us into it, I suppose, forced us. You know, don't sound great, but yeah, it did force us. We were, um, we saw that uh, there's a, a film festival in London called Sci-Fi London, uh, which runs every year. It's a big science fiction festival, um, and they they do this really innovative. 48 hour film competition. So on a Saturday morning, they give you a title, a line of dialogue, and a prop. Uh, and you've got 48 hours to go away and come up with a, 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 a short film between three and five minutes and submit it. And and um, you just go from there. So I kind of thought, well, this is a great opportunity because so many people I know who had done short films kind of, they'd let them drag on for a year or two years and they'd never quite got them finished. and you know, just the whole lethargy uh, about the whole process was something that I didn't want to kind of get embroiled in. So I thought a 48-hour project was, was a really good way to kind of galvanise everybody's thinking and, and, and get a movie done in a very, very short period of time and kind of uh, went, went ridiculously ambitious with it and, and got lots of um, kind of stuff donated to us by big uh, local companies, you know, for set. And, and catering and, and, and everything else and ended up with this huge crew and, and quite a talented cast, you know, and Sarah Stockbridge who's, who's had been to movies that I've worked on before and, and you know, this fantastic actress who very, very kindly came down and agreed to, to be in this short film for, you know, a kid that she'd basically seen around set before and we put together a, a big... Um, interior of a spaceship it was kind of 38 foot by 14 foot and it was four rooms and i had, I had about 10 or 12 people in the art department making it look you know great and it, it did look great and it the the, the, the whole 48 hour nature of the the 48 hour competition is, is is quite a difficult one to get your head around i think even when you've got a bit of experience and so for having no experience was was really difficult and and you, you very much learn on the job and, and I think we did another 40 hour competition later in the same year and, and, and again it's you know it's, it's a really great way of learning and it's also a really great way of learning who you do and don't want to work with again um, because you know you see people under intense pressure and and, and you, you have a great fun doing it and, and at the end of those two days you know, you've got a movie to show for it but it's, it's, it's a great learning curve more than anything else I think so we did that and then and then we, we, we kind of settled down once we, we got a good core group of people together and did a couple of normal shorts. Um, and then we did the short film version of Dogged, um, which was for another competition, but uh, for BBC Three, which was a TV channel over here, which is now no longer running. Um, and that was uh, for, for a TV show they had on that was basically like a, a talent show, but like the X Factor or something to find uh, horror filmmakers. You know, I was getting ready to ask you about that because, of course, there's a feature film and there's a short. Um, tell us first about the short and how you got involved with that and how it blossomed into the feature. Sure. So, yeah, so the, the short film, again, I, I it, it was made for the TV show. And, um, it, you know, I wanted to do something a little bit different. I'm not personally, I'm not, you know, all due respect to people who love these movies. I'm not a fan of kind of stalk and slash movies or movies where there's a monster that, you know, that's not always the case, but I'm not a massive fan of movies where there's a monster at the end, you know. I like things that are very plausible, very grounded uh, in, in reality um, uh, from the horror genre. And um, and so we decided to, to kind of do this half back to a subgenre, which was quite up underrepresented, up underrepresented at the time. Uh, which was folk horror, which kind of incorporates things like um, The Wicker Man um, and her movies like that. The kind of mythical folklore uh, type based horror movies where, where those things kind of, you know, come to the surface in, in the present day. Um, so we, we, did, we did a short version of that, which was kind of very loosely based on um, the, the, the fairy tale of Little Red Riding Hood, um, which was a, a nursery rhyme that I've been reading to to my kids at bedtimes and um, quite a lot of that period and it, it really struck me at it, how dark it was. Sure. Um, so, the, so the short film kind of followed that that kind of uh, template as it were for the, for the story um, and then um, they, they basically they, yeah, so they selected I think 30 movies or something uh, that had been submitted and they showed them to a, an audience uh, in a cinema and then they made this kind of TV show out of it. And um, our, our, our movie didn't end up getting shown on TV because 
there were too many movies that ended up with the same score. Oh man! <laughs> so, uh, a lot of movies ended up. A lot of movies ended up with the same score. I think there was five or something. Um, uh, so they didn't end up showing them. Uh, they they made you know they went down a different part of the TV show. But we got this nice email through saying that we finished uh, joint fifth uh, out of about five hundred entries. Mm. So we were quite stoked by it. So we went back and. We made a few alterations to it because for the TV show, it had to just be a three-minute movie, so we made it a tiny bit longer. Um, you know, we got a, a really nice grade on it done by one of our guys, Ash Mountain Lee, for example, who's fantastic. Um, and then we suddenly did it into some festivals um, to see what would happen, and we kind of ended up winning a few awards and, and getting this really positive feedback. And by that point, we'd actually already, Matt and I had already started writing the a feature-length script um, kind of more as a project than anything else. Um, and and it kind of all just stemmed from there. And, and the responses that we got were just so positive. We decided, well, you know, we're not getting any younger. We, we want to make a feature film. You know, we've got this solid platform to work off. So why don't we, why don't we you know, run with this? No, I'll I tell you, I went on YouTube and I checked out the trailer for it. And I am, you got me interested. I definitely want to see it. So... <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it definitely caught my eye. It just you're, you're right. It just it felt different. I felt like this just creeping sense of dread while watching the trailer. It, it was just a different feeling than what I get from what's pumped out over here from Hollywood. And I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, I well, like different horror. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, something else I wanted to ask you real quick while scanning over your resume before we get to your new project you know, you've worked so much on television and film, and I've never had the pleasure of working for television, but can you tell us, for you, is there a difference in preparation in, in working for a television show as opposed to a film production, and which do you prefer? Yeah, there's very little preparation at all for TV shows. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, a lot of the time, um, you know, they're, they're working with, with kind of much smaller budgets, much smaller crews, and, and although the crews are every bit as good as they are for film, um, what we find over here is that they're not, you know, there's so many scheduling issues that they have to deal with that they can't necessarily always, um, uh, you know, come up with us and say, well, look, in two months' time, we need, you know, a, a a palace garden in Ghana or something like that. You know, they'll they'll spring it on us the day before, um, <laughs> and and we kind of have to deal with those kinds of things more. Whereas whereas in film, you know, they're a bit more definitive. They're a bit more like, well, we need you to recreate part of the south of France, you know, in December and now it's February or whatever. You know, so so it's it's, it's a, a bit easier working with film in that sense. And now one of the other things is, you know. You've traveled everywhere. You've worked all over the place in Europe. You've worked in the United States. You've worked in Canada. What can you tell me about the differences in working in film in those three places? Or is um, there? Or is there? I, it, 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 it's kind of quite difficult. So when I've been working in North America, um, the crews that I've predominantly been working with have been European crews that have come over there. Uh -huh. um, what I would say is that, um, I, you know, I spent, I spent a, a decent amount of time working in the Netherlands and Holland, and um, that was a very, very relaxed atmosphere. It was kind of at the end of every day on wrap. Um, the caterers brought out cans of beer and, uh, and chips, and, you know, it was kind of, there was that kind of vibe going on, and... Uh, when I was working in Las Vegas, it was kind of a bit more like um, when, at the end of the day when the rap happens and everybody goes out drinking and goes to casinos for a few hours. Um, uh, and whereas, uh, when I was in Canada, it was very, very cold. So it was kind of, we rap here and then everybody goes back to their hotel rooms and gets under the covers. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I get that. And I just, I just find that interesting. Do you, you know, it's, Going going to another place, I mean, even in the United States, going to another city, another state to work on films, it's always just interesting to see how it's different. So, I, you know, I didn't know if it was really – so you would say that the, the industry is pretty comparable no matter where you work. It's just different location. It is to an extent. I mean, I, what I did find to be a big eye-opener when I came to the U.S. and Canada was um, working with unions. 
um, we don't have really any unions over here in Europe. Um, so that was kind of, you know, it was a very different experience for me. Um, uh, and that's probably the biggest difference that, that I've had, you know, between the two. But I say, you know, you know, both, both great ways of working, both very different ways of working, but, uh, yeah, equally fun. Now, of course, we're going to move on to your next big project, and that is the film Nefarious. And I'm looking at the Kickstarter page for it right now. Tell us a little bit about Nefarious and where you guys came up with the concept, without giving away too much, of course. Sure. So, um, uh, so it's a home and brain group this time, um, and I'm on with a few twists and turns. Um, so... With our, with our first movie, Dog, it's basically the, 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 the vast majority of the movie is set on a very, very small island. Um, uh, and most of the movie is set outdoors. Uh, a lot of it's set during the daytime. All of those things were, were intentional because they were so far away from uh, the kind of horror norm. Uh, that, you know, normally when you see stuff, it's kind of all in front all darkness, you know, lots of kind of smoke and mirrors. And we really wanted to, to go away from that. Um, and, and we, we, we had a great time doing it and it's had a very positive response, but I want to, I want to try something a little bit different this time. So we decided that, yeah, we, you know, we've been kind of, we, we made the first movie with a budget of 15,000 pounds, which was peanuts, um, really. And, uh, and, and what we wanted to do this time was be able to control kind of a lot more elements of the lighting, um, uh, you know, focus a little bit more on performances and, and kind of in some ways we're less ambitious than we have done with the first one. With the first one, we had 22, 23 principal cast and we were, we were located, you know, all over the south in England, you know, and then there was a lot of traveling involved and, and, you know, it, it, it was a fairly big scale production in terms of the, the budget that we had to spend. So this time what we wanted to do was kind of, you know, strip all that right back and then, you know, keep it as a character-based story, um, uh, but kind of limit those characters. I mean, I, I, I'd spent quite a lot of time watching movies that were limited to one location um, uh, just because I found them fascinating as to how it was possible for directors to keep the interest of audience audiences for, 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 you know, an hour, an hour, an hour and a half or two hours when, when, when the characters were primarily in one place. So I really wanted to challenge myself by trying to have a go at doing that. Um, uh, and when I sat down with uh, Matt Davies, I tried write these uh, movies with. We decided that you know we were going we to go down the home invasion uh, kind of route, and that the themes we wanted to really incorporate were, were kind of themes that we feel are are very pertinent um, uh, at the moment in modern society. So you know, there's kind of uh, a very strong element of the class divide um, uh, and kind of you know poverty and austerity, you know, against kind of the mega rich bankers. So there's, there's, there's that as one element. And then there's this kind of um, uh, indecisiveness about kind of mental health issues, about how a lot of people sit on the fence with, um, you know, deciding whether they think, you know, mental health is a real thing or, or if it's stigma or, you know, how, how that plays out in modern society and how people use it to their own advantages and, and manipulate people in those situations. Um, uh, and the other, the other one is, is kind of sexual manipulation, which has obviously been a, a huge kind of fallout, particularly within the film industry uh, over the last, you know, six or eight months. So we wanted to tie those things together, and 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 so we've tried to do that within the the, the, the kind of home invasion subgenre umbrella. It's you know I'm I'm looking over the site and everything you know the, this Kickstarter and you know the things that you guys are offering people as incentives are absolutely stunning. You know, I'm, I'm looking at the, the one that caught my eye was the, uh, the last big one, um, your company logo at the start and all of, you know, how has the response yeah. been? You know, uh, I'm, I'm looking at it. You guys have, you guys have some donations there. You guys have 47 days to go on the project, but you know, what has response been in, in your home country for this? Um, because I'm certainly going to share this here on Morbidly Beautiful so that it, it gets some more views. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it's been good. I mean, we, I think we had, uh, I think up till today, I think we've got 95 or 96 backers. 
um, which is which is a pretty good rate because we've been going, I think, 13 days or something, 12, 13 days. Um, and, and what we found with our last project uh, was we, we, that was a, a slightly smaller target, but we ran that for 16 days. And we, we had this similar sort of response within the first week, but then it kind of massively tailed off last time. And, you know, what we've done is we've, we've you know, we've gone, I think, from uh, from 25 to 30% of our funding goal this week, um, which is which is actually a great sign. We haven't dropped off. You know, it's a bit like those kind of second weekend box office returns. I think I was reading a, uh, an interview with Jason Bloom the other day where he said, you know, they knew that Get Out was going to be big when it didn't tail off massively for the second weekend of release. And and, and it's kind of a similar thing with us. I mean, we we you know, people do seem to be engaging with it and, the, the, the thing that we're trying to push is that, you know, this isn't just necessarily like a, a, like a art movie. It's not just a movie for, for people who are horror fans. You know, what we try and do is we, we make movies that are, you know, have, have horror within them at their core. Sure. Um, uh, you know, you, uh, it, what we found was we, you know, we had a few test screenings of our last movie and we, we purposely invited people along who we knew weren't horror fans and, Although one or two of them kind of were quite upset with us for, for making them watch a horror movie afterwards, they did say that, you know, this is the kind of movie that, you know, appeals to, to people who aren't necessarily horror fans. You know, it's so character-driven um, uh, and it has such strong themes that hopefully it, it's got a slightly broader appeal as well. Now, sadly, this particular title is not listed on D, uh, IMDb as of yet. I can't find it on there, but can yep. you tell us a little bit about uh, the cast and the crew that you have for this film? Because I know I'm seeing that several of them um, are from, of course, the Dogged production, but yeah, it'd be great. If you could give us yeah, a little bit so, of more uh, info on these people, that'd be fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, our, our crew are... Um uh, predominantly the same uh, that we use for Dogged and uh, that we've used for our shorts throughout the, the you know the, the time that we've been making movies. Um, so the the four of us uh, who, who co-founded Ash Mountain is myself, um, Chris Balser, who's the DOP, uh, Lee Wignall, who does editing and VFX and and kind of you know is a post production extraordinaire wizard, um, and Matt Davies, who's a co-writer, and then he he works as um, production manager as well when we're on set. So there's four of us. Um, uh, and we've got the same uh, um, production designer, uh, Mel, uh, costume designer, James, is back again. Um, our, our wonderful composer, James Griffiths, as well. Um, uh, Gemma and uh, Griffin, who do the, the, the hair and makeup for us, you know, it's across the board, you know, the, a lot of the same people coming back. And then that, I think that's a testament to how much fun we have doing it because, you know, it, it sounds brutal, but the fact is none of us make a penny out of it. Nobody gets paid for doing it. We, we simply do it because we love making these movies. Um, and, the, and the fact that these guys want to keep coming back and doing it again and again, you know, is, is really heartwarming. And I think it's a testament to how well we all get on and how much fun we have doing them. Um, when it comes to the cast, yeah, um, we've got a few people back from uh, from Dogger. We've got uh, wonderful Toby Wynn Davis. Um, who plays Father David in Dogged is coming back for us. Um, Nadia Lamin, who plays uh, Sparrow, and Greg Smith, uh, who plays John. Uh, and then we've got one or two newcomers as well. We've got uh, Aaron Thomas Ward, who um, a lot of horror fans might recognize from the Crypt TV short film The Birch, mm -hmm. um, which was very, very popular. Uh, he plays the lead in that. Um, uh, and then we've got Abby as well, Abby Gillette coming down. Um, it's going to be uh, a new summer for us as well. So we're excited to work with, you know, it, it's nice to have people there who, you know, Toby, Nadia, Greg, who kind of know how we operate, but then it's also exciting to bring in new people like Aaron and Abby, you know, to see how they interact with, with, with all the rest of us, in all honesty. Certainly, certainly. And, you know, like I said, I, I think the Kickstarter's great. I think as far as, as rewards that you're offering people, I mean, they're absolutely stunning. Like I said, uh, you know, the logo, you know, the, the $75 one where you have people that, you know, have their name or their picture in the movie. I mean, that's, it's really innovative. And, you know, I'm glad to see that a true independent filmmaker is using this for what it's made for. And I've asked other filmmakers this because 
we see it a lot more here in the states. I, again, I can't speak to to what happens over there, but it seems like more and more big name directors and studios are now trying to go to crowdfunding to get studio projects made. What are your thoughts on that as an independent filmmaker? I, I mean, I think it makes it the market more difficult for those of us who are truly independent and, and who don't have that kind of name behind us. I think it's really tricky. I mean, I, you know, I, I've never criticized anybody for, for doing it. Of course, you know, it's a free platform and it's open to everybody, but sure. you know, I think it does make things very difficult for the rest of us. And, and something else that, you know, that, that, that makes it difficult is, is, when filmmakers go on there and, you know, they promise the earth and, and they're going to take people's money and then they just disappear. And, and you know, it, that gives everybody, all of us, a bad name. Um, uh, I mean, as far as I know, I haven't, I haven't had any complaints on the, the three crowdfunding projects that I've managed so far. But, you know, we've got a 100% track record of, of delivering everything that we promise to our backers because... You know, it's just not fair. I mean, we, I'm, I'm a bit of a, a kind of a serial backer myself. I think I've backed something like 40 odd projects on Kickstarter over the last five or so years. And, and it's because I genuinely love, you know, seeing what, what some people do. And I've been burned on them myself. You know, there was kind of one guy who was, uh, he was offering to do this science fiction show and, you know, I threw, threw some money in and, you know, didn't hear anything from him for like, you know, two, three years. And then he sends an email saying, Oh, I'm, you know, I've, I've, I was living in New York, but now I'm living in LA and I still haven't made the movie, but thanks for your money anyway, kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's, um, it's a bit boring, you know, when you know you've, you've been out and you've worked hard to earn that money for yourself. And, and, you know, you're doing this kind of really generous thing of giving the money over to someone and, and, you know, to, to, to kind of, and, and, and in a lot of cases, people you don't know, you know, to, to kind of help them achieve, achieve their dream. And they're, they're kind of, you know, really taking the piss of that and taking <laughs> your money, essentially. But, you know, this is why we promise not to do that. And it's also the reason why we, we, we go with Kickstarter instead of uh, any of the rivals. So we're very firm on the idea that, you know, we want to have this kind of fixed goal. So we budgeted this movie correctly, you know, as far as we're aware. Um, uh, if we haven't, then, you know, we'll cover the shortfall ourselves. You know, we, we put a lot of our own money in anyway. This is kind of peripheral money that, that's going to pay things like catering and travel expenses and so on. So, uh, you know, other platforms, you can do a, a flexible funding goal. So, you know, you can say that it's going to cost you 20000 to make a movie and you can get 5000 in pledges and you still get that 5000 But right. to me, that doesn't feel fair because... I can't, you know, if I budgeted the movie at 20,000 and I get 5,000, then I can't go and make the movie with 5,000. You know, so I, uh, it, I, if I budgeted it at 20,000, if I don't get the 20,000, you know, I can't make the movie. So, you know, I'm not going to take people's money off them as it were. Right. I don't think it's fair because so many people are so generous on these projects that, that, you know, you, you have to give them something back and you have to show them that you're trustworthy and, and, you know, you're doing this for, for the good of it. You know, we're not doing it even to make a profit. And I hope that that's something that appeals to a lot of people. You know, we're just doing it for, you know, because of our passion. Who were your influences as horror film directors? Um, uh, I've got quite a lot, really. <laughs> uh, I, a lot of the old classics. I've been watching, you know, uh, one of my favorites I keep returning to is David Lynch stuff. Um, yeah. I, it's the, 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 the kind of theme that he has of kind of this very weird uh, uh, underworld, as it were, lurking just beneath the surface of kind of everyday normality is, is one that I return to again and again, um, uh, and, and visually as well. His stuff is stunning. Um, but also, you know, I love um, Kubrick and Fincher, um, uh, John Carpenter. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of influences in there. Hitchcock. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I have to ask, I have to ask this one too because I mean it's just a running topic right here in the states. All that shit with Harvey Weinstein in Hollywood. How how is the acting industry over there looking at that? Or you know how are you guys in the industry looking at it over there? I, I think we're all you know as, as kind of disgusted with it as everybody else is. I mean it's. Um, you know, there's been a number of other cases that have, that have popped up over here off the back of it, and I think um, one of the one of the key witnesses in the Weinstein case, in fact, was um, 
uh, I think a, a, a woman who worked for his London office um, who signed an NDA, and I just I just find the whole thing abhorrent. I mean, it's um, you know, I, uh, while I, I while I don't think that you know I've never heard anything specific about anybody, and and you know I would I would be horrified if I did about anybody specific. You know, there there, there is this kind of deep seated uh, uh, kind of. I don't know, understanding almost of the, 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 you know, and I put this in inverted commas, kind of the casting couch mentality that, you know, kind of has permeated the industry going back for decades and decades. And uh, I think it was, it had unfortunately got to a stage where it kind of was almost accepted um, right. as, a, as a thing. And, and, and that's why predators, you know, have been able to get away with it for such a long time, unfortunately. It's, I think it's the... Uh, it, you know, you shouldn't have to live in a world, I don't think, where you have to kind of publicly put your hand up and say, I'm not going to do this to you if you come and work for me. But, you know, it is, you know, we are in that, that day and age. And it, it's down to people like that who have completely abused the system in a, a completely disgusting manner. Yeah. Yeah, Awful. it's it's absolutely terrible. I mean, I agree with you 100%. And, you know, we just came off of Women in Horror Month and it's, you know, it's it's been a, a pervading topic of discussion ever since all, you know the news broke, and it's, I mean, it's stuff that people have talked about for years, but now it's you know really come to the head, and it's it's terrible. You know, I'm, I'm glad to see you guys feel as equally shitty about it as we do over here. Hopefully, he doesn't come over there to hide. Yeah, absolutely. But <laughs> I know I think I, yeah I mean I think you know it, I I think it's you know the, the sad thing is. It's not just a case of him, you know, we've, we've had this kind of whole thing. I don't know if you guys are aware of it. There's been this, uh, a whole police operation that's going on, been on, going here for a few years called Operation U Tree, which is, um, it, it was relating to celebrities in general who were kind of abusing their power and, and, you know, doing the worst kinds of, of sexual abuse and things on, on people and, you know, using their celebrity status to do so and, so that kind of has been, you know, ongoing here for, for several years before the wine thing, thing came out. And mm. it's, yeah, I think the whole thing is, yeah, I mean, but, but, you know, for me, I, it, it's perhaps different if you're in front of the camera, but people who get into the business uh, behind the camera, if they're doing it for anything other than the love of, of making movies or making TV, then they're getting into it for the wrong reasons in the first place. You know, I, I agree. I'm not getting into this because I want to be famous. I'm getting into it, you know, I, I make movies because I, I love making movies and I, and I want people to see my movies. I'm not doing it because I want people to know who I am. And that, you know, what kind of once you pass that line, uh, I think your, 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 your ego and your super ego just you know, goes through the roof and, and it's always going to lead to things like this, sadly. While I've never been a big fan of remakes, um, I always ask this of, of filmmakers when they come on, especially, you know, you, you're really starting to launch yourself into your directorial mode. If you had one dream horror project, you could m either make your own or remake any horror film that you wanted. What would it be and why? <laughs> oh, man, that's a great question. Um Oh, I've no idea. Um, I don't think I'd want to remake uh, uh, a horror film. Particularly, um, I, I just, yeah, I think I don't know. I, I, I don't want to use the phrase disrespectful because you know there are some remakes out there that are better than the originals. But um, I, yeah, I would always try and forge forge my own way, and 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 you know, I, I would love to do a convincing werewolf movie. Ah. <laughs> Uh, I, I think that they're probably one of the hardest ones to get right. Um, I love vampire movies. I'd love to have a go at doing something classical like Dracula. Um, but I'm not sure what you can bring new to it that, that, that hasn't been done in all of its incarnations already. So, Well, um, I will say... question. I'm not sure. I will say two of my favorite European movies from probably you know the last couple of years would have been Shaun of the Dead and uh, Cockneys vs. Zombies. Yeah, <laughs> Do, those both of those movies. Shaun of the Dead is a great movie. For some reason, both of those movies crack me the hell up. I think they're just fantastic filmmaking, and I try to show those to as many people as possible. But we're coming up right here on the end. Yeah. So before we go, 
Tell people about any other projects you may have coming up uh, and where we can find you, social media, websites, things like that. Um, so, yeah, um, uh, you can find us on social media. My personal one on Twitter is at R underscore Roundtree, R O W N T R E. Um, uh, and you can find us at, at Ash Mountain Film uh, and at Nefarious Movie and at Dog of the Movie. Uh, and then on Facebook, if you do not Dog of the Movie, uh, sorry, if you search on Facebook for Dog of the Movie or uh, Nefarious, um, you should find both of us on there. Uh, with those um, and of course the Kickstarter link um, which well, if you just if you look for Nefarious on kickstarter.com uh, we should come up on there we're the only one called Nefarious it's still live at the moment oh yeah it popped um, right and, up yeah, it's, and I'll post I'll post the links for four. that on uh, uh, Morbidly Beautiful we'll get something out on that for sure Perfect. Thank you very much. Oh, it's it's not a problem. You know, in, in closing, you know, since you've had so much experience, you've, you've been to school, you know, you're working in the industry, writing, directing, producing, everything. If there was advice that you could give to someone who's looking to break into the industry, what would you tell them? Uh, plain and simple. Go out and make a movie. Shoot it on your phone if you have to. You don't need fancy equipment. Just find a few friends that, that want to make a movie with you. Go out and shoot it. The, the best way of learning how to make a movie is by just keep making movies. Keep making movies. Make your own mistakes. You don't have to put them out there if you don't want. Just do them for yourself. And and that's the best way to learn. I agree with you 100%. That's how I learn. You, you know, I envy you in a lot of ways. You went to school and learned how to do it. I, I learned the hard way and went out there and, and just did it over time. And, and I think... You know, I look forward to seeing more of your work. You're always welcome here on the podcast. Like I told you, if you ever have news you need Thank put you. out, let me know. Um, it really was an honor having you on, and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you very much for having me on, and thank you, everybody, for listening. And I would like to say thank you to my guest, director, writer, producer, and actor, Richard Roundtree. I really think this man is going to make an impact in the industry. And it's always to me nice to meet young and up and coming directors from over the pond. I'm really looking forward to his next film, Nefarious. Coming up in just a few moments, we're going to go to our final digital dismemberment spotlight for the evening, where we will be reviewing Screen Factory's Blu ray release of Psycho 3. But before that, it's time for our final Metal Massacre spotlight. The name of the band is Dark Moon Warrior, the CD is Nuke Em All, and the song is Satanification.
and welcome back. You just heard the band Dark Moon Warrior. The CD was New Cabal, and the song was Satanification. Dark Moon Warrior is a black metal band from Germany that was formed in 1996. Their website's in German. It's a little bit hard to really glean that much more info on them. Uh, a lot of sites really don't have much to tell you, but if you head on over to www.darkmoonwarrior.repage.de, if you can read German or know someone that can, you'll find out where they're touring, how to pick up their CDs and their merchandise, and just general information about the band. But now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for our final digital dismemberment. And in our final digital dismemberment spotlight this evening, we are covering Screen Factory's Blu-ray and DVD release of the collector's edition of Psycho 3. Now, the film is directed by Anthony Perkins, produced by Hilton A. Green and Don Zepfel. Special effects were handled by Michael Westmore, Louis R. Cooper, Danny Lester, and Carl G. Miller. The cast includes Anthony Perkins, Diane Scarwood, Jeff Fahey, Roberta Maxwell, Hugh Gillen, Lee Garlington, Robert Allen Brown, Gary Bayer, Patience Cleveland, Juliet Cummins, Steve Guevara, Kay Herbley, Donovan Scott, Karen Hensel, Jack Murdoch, Kat Shea, Hugo Stranger, Lisa Ives, Angela Ritter, and Diane Rodriguez. It was released on Blu-ray by Shot Screen Factory in 2013. To give you the premise, Anthony Perkins returns to the role of Norman Bates and makes his directorial debut in the second sequel to the Alfred Hitchcock classic Psycho. The Bates Motel is once again the site of something evil as the rehabilitated Norman attempts to help a disturbed young woman, Maureen Coyle, who has left the convent because she can't find any proof that God exists. Maureen bears a striking resemblance to one-time Bates Motel guest Marion Crane, which puts Norman on edge. At the same time, a nosy reporter is snooping around the town looking into Norman's past. Suspense, terror, and black comedy worthy of the master himself are all in hearty supply in the most shocking cycle of them all. And yes, from here on out, there will be spoilers. What can be harder than following up a successful sequel to one of the most iconic horror films of all time? Anthony Perkins answers that question with his directorial debut in Psycho 3. And for a first-time director, he does a very admirable job. With enjoyable performances by Diane Scarwood and Jeff Fahey to lead the story on, Perkins delivers what may be his most unhinged performance of Norman as he continues to run the motel after the events of the second film. You can certainly question why anyone would want to stay at Norman's motel, even if they did not know the circumstances of what had happened there in the past, just by some of his facial ex reactions and body language. But Perkins still manages to show his duality with exuding some of the boyish charm that Norman still possesses throughout the film. Perkins himself stated that he felt he was not ready to direct this film um, <clears throat> on an experience and technical level, even asking Psycho 2 director Richard Franklin to co-direct, which he, he said no. But he manages to deliver a film that follows through with the storylines that were presented in the previous two films. The film certainly delivers more nudity and gore than the previous entries of the series, and that may throw some viewers off that are looking for more of the voyeuristic look and feel of the original. But by becoming more graphic, it certainly shows a whole other side to Norman's madness that we may not have ever even contemplated. Maureen is praying in front of a statue of the Virgin Mary, begging for a sign. She then goes to the top of the bell tower at her church, with the other nuns trying to stop her from jumping. <clears throat> As she pulls away from one of the nuns, the nun slips and falls to her death below. 
In disgrace, Maureen runs away through the desert until she runs into Duke, who's played by Jeff Fahey. He gives her a ride until she rebuffs his advances and once again wanders through the streets. The next day, <clears throat> we see the Bates Motel with a sign in the window for help wanted. Norman walks through and picks up some dead birds to use as his taxidermy dummies. While working and eating in the kitchen, we see a newspaper article about Emma Spool and a flashback to Norman killing her at the end of the second film. Duke shows up at the motel and winds up applying for the desk job. As Norman goes to the Statler's Cafe to pick up food, we hear the owner and sheriff talking about the disappearance of Mrs. Spool. A news reporter is there and starts trying to dig up things on Norman. She is warned by the sheriff to leave him alone, <clears throat> but she starts in on Norman, who at first answers her questions until Maureen comes into the diner and he starts having flashbacks to the original murder. Maureen winds up walking to the motel and runs into Duke. He assures her that he is sorry for the other night and she rents a room. Norman comes down and is quite shaken by the fact that she's in room one. Norman goes back to the house and has an argument with Mother about what to do about her. Duke goes into town and runs into the reporter. She shoots him down until she finds out he works at the Bates Motel. Back at the motel, Norman spies on Maureen as she gets ready for a shower. He goes in for the kill but finds she has slit her wrists in the tub and saves her life. While passing out, she thinks he is the Virgin Mary. At the bar, the reporter tells Duke everything about Norman. At the hospital, Norman is praised as a hero by everyone, but the reporter continues to stir the pot. He invites her to stay at the motel free of charge, and she agrees. When he gets home, he argues with Mother again while Duke shows up with, the, with another lady from the bar. After a wild night of drugs and sex, Duke kicks her out. While making a phone call outside, she's brutally murdered by someone. Norman catches the reporter at his house, and he asks her to leave. Marine shows back up, at the motel, as a large party shows up, Norman has her clothes cleaned and they later go out on the town. The reporter rummages through Mrs. Spool's old apartment and finds the number to the motel on a magazine. After returning from their date, Maureen makes advances towards Norman, but he just can't do it. He lays with her for a while, but when she awakens, he is not there. We hear Mother chastising him for being with Maureen. Maureen tries to come to the house, and he makes her go back to her room. Later, one of the partygoers has her throat slit in the bathroom, and Norman hides the body. The police show up and find nothing. As the reporter continues to stir things up, Maureen leaves, and Norman has a confrontation with Duke. With everything that is going on, <clears throat> is Norman back to his old ways of killing, or is someone trying to frame him again? You're going to have to watch to find out. Bonus features include an audio commentary with screenwriter Charles Edward Pogue. There's a featurette that runs 17 minutes called Watch the Guitar. It's an interview with actor Jeff Fahey. He talks about being in awe of the house his first night on the set, his early roles, and how he has played offbeat characters, and working with Anthony and how Perkins slipped into the role of Norman at the drop of a hat. The pressures Anthony had as an actor and director on the film the cast and crew, the semi-nude scene that he improvised, being injured during the fight scene between Duke and Norman, the car scene, and a funny story about Quentin Tarantino and Robert Rodriguez quoting lines from the film. There's uh, another featurette that runs nine minutes called Patsy's Last Night. It's an interview with actress Kat Shea. Kat discusses how she became involved in the film. She got the role by... Uh, Talking to a bush, which is actually kind of funny, but she also talks about working with Anthony Perkins, her graphic death scene, being put in an ice chest with real ice and nearly freezing while shooting. Uh, there's another one entitled Mother's Maker, around 11 minutes. It's an interview with makeup special effects creator Michael Westmore. He talks about how Universal wanted to put together a team of people that worked at the studio going back to the original film for Psycho 3 working with Anthony Perkins, the difference between the look of Mother in the original in Psycho 3, how we did the slit wrist effects in the bathtub, and some of the more grisly makeup moments in the film. The last one is entitled Body Double. It's about five minutes long. It's an interview with Brink Stevens. 
Brink discusses several of the films she did during the early 80s, how she became typecast as a horror movie actress, meeting Anthony Perkins for the role of Diane Scarwood's body double, and the generalities of working on the film. It also includes a theatrical trailer and a still gallery. This is a one-disc set in NTSC format. It is a color film and rated R. The aspect ratio is 1080p high definition widescreen, 185.1. Shout and Scream Factory bring to us Anthony Perkins' directorial debut to Blu-ray DVD with Psycho 3. Vastly superior to the 2005 Universal and the 1999 Game in America's release, this is certainly the disc to own. While the Psycho 2 release was light on modern interviews, Shout Screen Factory has more than made up for that with this release, and those interview segments alone make this an interesting watch. In particular, the Watch the Guitar segment with Jeff Fahey and Mother's Maker with Michael Westmore. They give us in keen insights to the passion that the cast and the crew had while making the film and show a warm and love, a love that many threes don't get. Also seen Brink Stevens talk about her work as a treat considering she has pretty much retired from the industry. As usual, the audio and picture quality are of amazing quality, and even if this film is not your favorite in the series, the special features on this release are yet again a perfect example of why Shout Screen Factory is the standard bearer for Blu-ray horror releases. I give the movie a 3 out of 5. I give the Blu-ray an 8 out of 10. So to make sure to head on over to ShoutFactory.com to pick up your copy of the Blu-ray and DVD Collector's Edition release of Psycho 3. Well, once again, ladies and gentlemen, I think we had an absolutely fantastic show. I want to say thank you so much to my fantastic guest this evening. That was writer, director, producer, and actor Richard Roundtree. I think he's a man to watch. You should definitely keep your eyes on him. I want to say thank you to Screen Factory for sending us our co Blu-ray copies of Dark Angel and Psycho 3 for review. And I want to say thank you to the three bands we highlighted in our Metal Massacre Spotlight this week. Those bands included Necrophobic, Ultar, and Dark Moon Warrior. Don't forget that on Friday nights at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, you can catch the Calling Hours Horror Podcast on Mile High Radio as it is now a nationally and internationally syndicated podcast. That is 7 p.m. on the West Coast, 10 p.m. on the East Coast. And until then, this is your host, the dead man, Michael Jones of MorbidlyBeautiful.com, Coffee and Cuties Magazine, and Digital Dead Magazine, telling you all to rest in peace.